So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kerry Snyder. I'm one of the co-founders of KEF Robotics. We're a 14-person robotics company in Pittsburgh, PA. Um, in this talk, I'm going to cover how we develop vision-based piloting systems for PX4 vehicles, and specifically how we leverage existing PX4 features and new PX4 features to enable safe testing of vision-based autonomy systems. So a little summary of the talk. I'll give a brief overview of KF, what our technology is and what we do, um, cover how that feeds into some constraints that we have that may be different from uh, other companies and other approaches to some of these challenges. Uh, then I'll dive into three key challenges that we've worked on uh, with PX4. So leveraging GPS denied state estimation in a PX4 vehicle, um, doing autonomous missions in a GPS denied world, and then uh, uh, performing onboard obstacle avoidance um, for particularly for multi-rotor drones. Briefly cover some of the future work um, for both us and um, PX4 as well. Um, so first off, this presentation definitely won't be a pitch. If you want to hear our pitch, find me and I'll be happy to give it to you. Um, uh, but I do want to talk briefly about our technology so that we can see how that feeds into the um, uh, how we use PX4. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Okay. So shown here is an example payload uh, that we've developed. It's got a handful of cameras uh, built in computing, the Voxel 2 actually from Modal AI. Um, and uh, since we built this back in May, we've attached it to a bunch of different vehicles and demonstrated GPS denied um, navigation and state estimation um, by putting all the cameras and the computing into a box. You can kind of uh, control a lot of the challenging robotics acts, aspects like synchronization, triggering, time stamping, uh, uh, all of those things, and then have a relatively high level interface to a um, uh, PX4 based vehicle, in this case, a serial Mavlink connection. Um, so I have a few of our prototype, uh, prototype payloads up here with me. Um, there'll be pictures as well. So um, if you want to check them out afterwards or come find me. So yeah, uh, one of our main products is relative vision-based navigation. So that's sometimes called VIO, visual inertial odometry, or SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, um, where we track and localize features on the ground with a downwards facing camera, and then fuse them with other sensor inputs to estimate the motion of the vehicle. Um, in particular, we at KF focus on challenging conditions and large scale environments. So high speed, highly dynamical motion and low or zero light uh, conditions. So this video shows some of our diagnostics for state estimation flying based on a thermal camera. And it's actually flying just before dawn. So that's one of the more, most challenging conditions for uh, thermal cameras because the uh, overnight, the temperature of the world has kind of normalized to be um, close to the close to uniform. Um, and with this capability, we expect drift rates, so that's error over as a function of distance traveled, of less than 2% in a wide variety of conditions. So we've flown up to 100 miles per hour and um, down to 10 meters altitude, both day and night. Um, one thing to note here, um, VIO or SLAM algorithms will pretty inherently drift over time. That's uh, a function of um, how they work. So uh, in integrating with a vehicle that's maybe expecting GPS or expecting some other absolute measurement, um, there are some challenges there in both position handling and heading handling. We'll talk about that. Another capability that we've been working on more recently is absolute vision-based navigation by matching image data to a stored map on board the vehicle, uh, as demonstrated in this helicopter flight video. Um, key areas, so a bunch of people do this, key areas we're focusing on is um, leveraging machine learning to make the system more robust to differences between the incoming image and the map that you have on board. So here we show uh, a wintertime flight where we're comparing to a uh, summertime map. So there's snow on the ground, the trees look very different, um, uh, a number of features that kind of make traditional computer vision uh, approaches uh, fail in these scenarios. Um, 
The other related aspect is trying to lower and lower the altitude at which this image matching can succeed. So um, uh, uh, a bunch of planes do this at 10,000 feet and beyond. Uh, we've had success down to around 120 feet with uh, traditional uh, UAS that lets us actually test in the 400 foot um, uh, range allowed by the FAA. Um, and that's using just off the shelf half meter um, USGS or commercially available satellite imagery. Um, and showed that at the end, we also do this at night using uh, long wave IR thermal cameras. Third capability, onboard hazard detection and avoidance, leveraging stereo vision to map local obstacles and plan safe trajectories. Uh, we've also done this at both day and nighttime by leveraging thermal cameras in a stereo configuration. Um, particularly in this case, we're interested in those low light conditions as well as scaling from small constrained indoor environments to uh, large scale outdoor environments. Uh, to provide these capabilities, we do build some prototype payloads. We're not really a hardware company, at least we're not right now. Um, uh, we do build our own drones for testing so that when they crash, we can fix them easily. Uh, and then we also provide a C software SDK that lets our customers feed sensor data into our software and get back out these state estimates or trajectories uh, on their platform. To date, we've demonstrated some portion of these capabilities on 14 different vehicles, uh, three of our own platforms, and seven that are available, available commercially off the shelf. Um, a major benefit of PX4 and the PX4 ecosystem is that now that we've proven out this process on a number of different vehicles, we can scale it very quickly to PX4-based systems. So actually, this past week, we got closed-loop flight up and running on uh, two new vehicles over about two days' time. Um, using the payload-based approach. Uh, I'll also note, as a small team, we're mostly focused on multi-rotor platforms, uh, although you'll see on here some VTOL and helicopter platforms as well that we're uh, moving towards now. Um, so yeah, uh, that's enough about KEF. So uh, due, to these, due to our business model, um, we have a number of additional constraints on our software beyond kind of the baseline metrics of drift, trajectory error, spherical error probability, false positive rates, things like that. Um, one is that we're loosely coupled, so we don't handle spinning the props. We most of the time rely on a PX4 autopilot to do that, um, and we don't have to or really want to operate in a hard real-time uh, system. Uh, that also means we may only have a software-based timing synchronization with the autopilot, um, so we have to be uh, pretty careful in our timing, even though we are in soft real-time. Uh, we also have to work with existing vehicles, uh, commercial vehicles that maybe are already being sold or are in development. Um, those may be running older versions of PX4, customized versions of PX4, or in some cases may not be running PX4 at all. Um, ideally, we'd like to be able to provide all of these capabilities to any vehicle that's at least running uh, upstream PX4 without any required modifications to that software. Um, because of this, I'll talk a fair bit about older versions of PX4 in this talk. Uh, that's also the reason I'll talk a lot about Mavlink. Um, there's lots of cool stuff happening in the ROS interfacing world, but for these older systems and existing systems, uh, we're, we're gonna be stuck with uh, Mavlink for a while. Um, some other actually beneficial <laughs> constraints are we typically operate in a fully GPS denied mode, so things get a lot trickier when you're integrating with GPS and you have to deal with potential drift in heading or drift in position versus a GPS sensor. Um, and similarly, we, we focus on push, what we call push button autonomy. So you plan a mission, you send off the drone, it goes and completes that mission with little to no operator input. Um, so we don't really at the moment work on piloting assistance or other um, operator aiding technologies. So yeah. Uh, dive into these three key challenges and uh, how we address them with PX4. So first up is safely testing GPS denied state estimation. Um, so here's a high level overview, um, how our system, so the KF payload in this case could be either pure software uh, deployment to an existing vehicle or a hardware payload like we have up here. Um, software is called Tailwind, it's a marketing name, whatever. Um, uh, typically, that communicates over Mavlink to the PX4 Flight Management Unit, FMU, 
um, oftentimes over a UART connection or locally potentially over a network Mavlink connection. Inside the PX4, this connection is handled by the Mavlink module, specifically mostly the Mavlink receiver um, code. And then that top uh, communicates through the UORB topics to the EKF2, which is uh, the main uh, PX4 module that we'll be talking about uh, in this section. So over Mavlink, we send either vision position estimate in some older versions or the odometry message. And that gets translated to the vehicle visual odometry topic within PX4 that feeds into the external vision subsystem of EKF2. Um, at this stage, so when you're first getting started, timing is the key question. So um, in a perfect world, you're triggering your cameras and you know a precise timestamp of when that image was uh, triggered to be captured. Um, and then you can take that timestamp, synchronize it with the autopilot and provide the autopilot the precise time when that measurement applies. Um, getting all of that timing right is pretty important to getting particularly a, a low drift and robust uh, visual navigation solution. If you don't have that, um, you can get away with uh, kind of a softer synchronization approach. So there's an EKF2 EV delay parameter. Um, what we have done in the past is uh, do some flights, uh, look at the logs and try to manually estimate kind of the average uh, offset between your uh, VIO states and the EKF2 states, and then uh, incorporate that in the EV delay parameter. Next up, you need to configure EKF2 to actually take in your visual position estimates. So prior to 1.14, which came out a few days ago, um, uh, you'd use the EKF2 aid mask parameter. Uh, you can enable position, velocity, or yaw fusion from uh, a VIO system. Here, it's a representation of a bit mask, but the difference is whether or not you enable velocity fusion, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, the other thing uh, we re I'd recommend here is you can uh, disable IMU bias estimation. Um, if you're first getting started trying to get your uh, GPS denied visual nav system working, um, that can actually help prevent some uh, failure cases, which we'll also talk about in a second. Um, in 1.14, um, this flag has changed, so there are separate control flags for all the different inputs to EKF2. So in this case, you would uh, turn on all of the EV inputs, which is actually the default value, and then turn off the GPS uh, inputs to that, um, to the EKF2 filter. Um, for mag type, that's how the EKF handles magnetometer fusion. Uh, we definitely start with uh, no magnetometer fusion in EKF2. So a lot of SLAM systems uh, don't have any reference to true north or magnetic north. So um, it's easier to get started if you kind of uh, cut out that heading alignment challenge from the filter fusion. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that uh, going forward. Um, if you are able to uh, get that north alignment in your vision-based nav solution, then you can incorporate the magnetometer data in EKF2 as well. Um, last bit is height mode. So I think the default is barometer for uh, older versions and 1.14. Um, we usually stick with that. There are some various cases if you're trying to do train following or other things where you might want to change that, but um, typically Barrow works well. Um, so next, you need to actually tune EKF2 to uh, accept your visual state estimates. So the correct way to do this is to use SD logging, uh, enable the proper profiles, and then do a bunch of open loop flights. So running your um, visual navigation solution on board the drone, flying it around a bunch, and uh, collecting these log files. Then the EKF2 replay tool lets you tune the parameters to the EKF as well as uh, the code. Um, and you can use that to uh, make sure that the filter is happily accepting your vision pose estimates and if necessary, fusing them with GPS or other sensors on the vehicle. Um, uh, we did this recently with the help of some folks at Autirian, um, landed on a uh, EVP noise. So this is the positional variance of the vision measurements going to the filter of 0 0.8, that's in meters. Um, the default is 0 0.5, so a little bit higher, but um, likely end up somewhere in that range. Um, you can also add in uh, uncertainty values to the odometry messages that you're sending over Mavlink. Um, we haven't done much experimentation with that, um, but that one might be one way to help achieve uh, 
stable flight performance at a wider variety of altitudes. Um, that's kind of uh, one challenge of vision-based nav systems. Um, one thing I don't suggest you do is uh, increasing the vision gate size. So this is a threshold for when the filter actually incorporates your um, visual nav uh, estimates uh, to 100, which basically says always trust vision. <laughs> um, uh, it can work and it can get you flying if you're having trouble um, uh, and you're in a pinch, but it can also make the failure cases a lot worse if something goes wrong with your vision-based nav. So speaking of uh, uh, failure and fail safety, so at this point, you'll want to start trying to fly in position mode uh, based on your vision states rather than GPS. Um, as some of you may know, if you've worked with vision systems in the, in the past, they tend to fail by exploding or moving very far distances very quickly. Um, it, if you haven't messed with the gate parameters, then EKF2 will stop accepting those measurements and transition typically into altitude flight mode. Um, so depending on the airframe, it can still be a little bit challenging to fly and land in altitude, especially if there's high wind or other um, disturbances or if it's a faraway drone. Um, so something to be aware of, um, start out slow, easy flights, and be prepared to take over in altitude mode. Um, if you trust the VIO data or the vision data too much, you can actually, we have seen it corrupt other states within EKF2, such as the orientation or the um, sensor bias states. Uh, if that happens, then the drone may not know which way is up and may require um, a takeover into acro mode. Um, so if you reach that point, um, at least in our experience, hopefully you're using uh, FPV safety piloting, uh, but it's, it's pretty tricky and I would definitely avoid that case uh, if you can uh, at all. Some other notes, if you're trying to fuse GPS with uh, vision states in EKF2, it will mostly just ignore your visual states and fuse the GPS or rely on the GPS data. Um, so that's not super helpful, especially for um, testing and evaluation. And then uh, we found that uh, simulation is not super helpful in this case. Um, the performance of VIO is pretty much directly tied to the real world issues of uh, uh, noise and noise models for all the various sensors that you're using. And um, we haven't found a good way to really simulate that um, in a meaningful way that helps um, debug these kinds of issues. Uh, for safer piloting and not having to rely on uh, altitude or acro mode, um, if you have a relatively recent uh, FMU processor and version of PX4, uh, you can use what we call multi-filter. Um, so PX4 is the built-in capability to run multiple instances of the EKF2 uh, based on different IMU sensors in particular, at least up to um, uh, current 1.14. Um, We've modified that with our own kind of hacky patch to um, uh, instead let those different instances have different parameter configurations. So you can configure one filter as just a pure GPS only fallback filter, and then another filter as your um, uh, VIO only filter. And then also we've implemented switching between those filters using uh, a remote control uh, from the safety pilot. So for us, this was about a 400 line patch to 1.13. Uh, along with some other diagnostics so that we can see the status of this over Mavlink. Um, uh, some folks from Arterian also worked on a version of this that's available on a branch uh, off on Upstream. So um, uh, you can grab the link from the slides to check out. That's much cleaner. Definitely recommend uh, starting there if you're interested in incorporating this into um, your own PX4 vehicle. So in that case, um, I guess I've got a video. Uh, yeah, not a great video, but uh, a little bit of glitchiness, but um, uh, PX4 actually handles switching between different states and different positions very well. Uh, so um, it looks like this isn't loading, but you might see some jerkiness, but um, in every case we found, it's able to safely transition back into position mode based on GPS and you can regain control of the vehicle. So here it'll drift away a little bit and then um, snap back and then, um, and then the pilot can regain GPS mode control. So yeah, uh, next up, autonomy. So in this case, the, our payload or software is 
actually telling the vehicle where to go. Um, the overall architecture looks very similar. Biggest difference is now we're dealing with the uh, position controller and also the commander within PX4 that's getting typically, in most cases, positional set points from our software, although we'll talk about trajectory set points as well in a bit. Um, so in a perfect world, as soon as you get that position mode working, close the loop with your vision-based nav system, then you can take advantage of all the other benefits of PX4, different mission modes, lawnmower, loiter, things like that. Um, prior to 1.14, uh, a global position was actually required in order to transition or stay in mission or offboard mode, uh, or mission or auto mode, sorry. Um, so we, uh, uh, up until recently, used um, offboard mode and implemented, re implemented a lot of that waypoint following and uh, autonomous capabilities in our software stack. Um, so it works. It's not a great user experience, especially when you start, want to start deploying this to people that are familiar with PX4 or Q Ground Control. Um, uh, so um, this was actually fixed again uh, with, uh, by folks at Aterian in uh, the 1.14 release so that you can, as long as you have a GPS home position, you can propagate that location um, using local position estimates from vision-based nav. Um, so in either case, um, we, we generate spline trajectories internally for going to waypoints and for avoiding hazards. We sample those typically on our side. So take the current time, sample the trajectory spline, and send those set points to the uh, multi-rotor controller as a position target. Uh, what we found uh, is that adding in velocity actually doesn't really help that much. Um, haven't dug into it too much, not sure if that's just a consequence of the PX4 control architecture or if our vehicles have bad tuning or whatnot, but um, uh, yeah, in our experience, just sending a position target that's moving over time uh, is the best way to achieve off-board control. So next week's concern is figuring out actually where you wanna go. So um, if you're GPS denied, then you can't really say go to this lat long point. Maybe you can propagate uh, and maintain that global reference frame, but you're going to be drifting. You might not be able to actually get there uh, with a reasonable amount of accuracy. Um, you can try to line up kind of your uh, heading or yaw at takeoff, um, but uh, if you're trying to fly far distances, so in this case on the left is a three kilometer traverse and then a, a search phase and then a three kilometer return to home. Um, you can see even a tiny yaw offset at the beginning of the trajectory can lead to a, a large um, deviation in position uh, at those far distances. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it starts to get tricky. Um, magnetometer fusion can also be really tricky when you don't have GPS. So the uh, uh, observations of your absolute location from the GPS actually really help estimate the magnetometer biases, uh, which helps give you a more precise idea of your heading from that magnetometer. So when you don't have those absolute estimates, um, yeah, it be, just becomes a much trickier question to try to estimate the magnetometer biases and get a, a reliable heading from that magnetometer. Um, I mentioned terrain matching before at the beginning. That's another option. You have to fly above a certain altitude and you have to have a prior map. It takes a lot of compute time, but um, that's one way to help lock in your absolute position and heading. Um, Another option is to plan a mission that doesn't actually require GPS or any sort of absolute knowledge. So in the example on the right, um, we have a mission where we take an image of a building and then send the drone out to a certain point to try to find that um, building based on some machine learning networks. Um, so, and then once we found it, we can localize it in space and actually fly to it and uh, survey it or something else. Um, uh, what that means is that we don't actually care where the building is at. We don't care about our GPS coordinate. We can uh, find it, go to it, and then return back to close to where we took off from. Um, so number of options, but it is something to think about. Um, if you aren't uh, tying into GPS, then um, you'll need to figure out where to actually go. Um, Final interesting note is geofencing. So a lot of test sites, especially in the US, will require some sort of geofencing in order to actually test there. Um, oftentimes, they're located next to smaller airports. Um, so uh, this is built into PX4. Um, we haven't tested it too extensively, fortunately, um, for us. Um, but you can tell that geofence to use the uh, raw GPS data rather than your global position estimate. So 
if as long if your fusion is operating without GPS, uh, but you still have a GPS on board, you can still uh, maintain a failsafe and uh, geofencing capability. Um, final challenge I want to talk briefly is hazard detection and avoidance. So, like I discussed, we use offboard mode for this. Um, really, no way around it. You have to have a good safety pilot. You have to have real-time feedback of where the drone is at and what it's planning to do. And you have to build confidence in that system over time in order to uh, trust it to avoid hazards and know what you expect it to do when it approaches a hazard. Uh, this is also one case where uh, I definitely recommend simulation. You can achieve a su sufficient fidelity to test out a lot of your algorithms in sim, uh, unlike um, vision-based nav. And um, yeah, build that confidence through simulation hours rather than flight testing hours. Um, another note, uh, I talked a little bit about the trajectory representation options. So we're sending positional set points most of the time. It works okay, but you can see in the video on the right, um, tracking performance, at least in our experience, is not great. So you have to have a pretty wide margin around uh, your planned trajectory and your obstacles in order to safely fly. Um, we solved that by just bumping up our uh, safety threshold. Um, uh, only have briefly investigated the Bezier trajectory representation, which would let us send actual trajectories over to the drone and let it do the sampling and control internally. Um, but uh, definitely interested in pushing forward with an approach like that to enable more precise path following and uh, tighter tolerance in hazard detection and avoidance. Uh, talked a lot about doing our various capabilities at night, that kind of compounds all the issues of flight testing. Uh, you have to have anti-collision lights, and um, uh, we've actually done some, some tests with thermal first-person video. So uh, top right and left images are a low-light FPV cam versus a thermal FPV cam, a lot more situational awareness and a lot more uh, texture availability to help the pilot um, uh, understand where the vehicle is at and fly it safely. So. Um, it's tough. Uh, similarly, you just got to kind of build confidence in the system and um, uh, have your fail safes ready to go. Um, coming up on time, but last few notes, uh, heading fusion, only touched on a little briefly, uh, Mathieu from Aterian is giving a talk on that, uh, I think tomorrow, so definitely check that out. That's a big question for a relative navigation system versus GPS. Um, getting GPS back is also a big question. We fortunately haven't had to dive too deeply into that, although we're actively working on it now. Um, a little bit more of a guidance question than actually a state estimation question in some senses, but um, yeah, something to definitely be aware of. And then uh, final question is, how do we fuse in our absolute vision-based observations with EKF2 so that we can actually know where the drone is at in an absolute sense, uh, just based on visual systems? And that's, yeah, definitely also a work in progress, fusing in those alternative, probably noisier latitude longitude estimates into EKF2 in real time. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. Uh, thank you so much. Shout out to uh, some of the other folks at KF that have worked a lot with PX4, Eric, Paul, and Andrew, and our test pilots who have uh, dealt with these challenges head on, Jake and Kurt, and then a bunch of folks from Ontario. we've recently started working with Mathieu, Daniel, TJ, Sylvan, and Tizian. Um, come by, done a bunch of flight testing and helped us um, push some of these forward into upstream PX4. So yeah, um, KF is hiring, uh, thanks so much. Thank